Boom. <laughs> Sorry. I just have to have a sense of humor right now because everything is happening outside my house that way. When I'm out recording on the patio, they're currently now resurfacing the parking lot and fixing things and doing a lot of construction. So unfortunately right now I can't record out there. So having to move inside kind of brings us together. We get to be up close and personal. <laughs> oh no, not personal, not that close, not getting real. <laughs> Why not? I'm me, you're you, and the Lord is in us. If we have the joy of the Lord, which you know God has placed in us because He has done all the work for us, then the reality of enjoying life becomes even more so obvious to us because we can, even in our adversity, rejoice that we know where we're going. We know who has saved us. We know how He did it. And we know because grace brought us this far, grace is going to take us the rest of the way. And it's not just grace as though it were an entity or something that, you know, has its own power and authority, but because it's done by someone who gives the grace by our Father in Heaven, who said because of the work that His Son has done for us, He has accepted the sacrifice of sin so that we could be made righteous in order to come to Him with all of our heart, with all of our emotions, which is our soul. So with all of our heart and all of our soul, with all of our mind, our thoughts, our thinking, with our strength, with everything we do, we can come to the Lord our God and give it to Him as a loving Father looks upon the works of His children and says, Good job, son! I like this ashtray. <laughs> oh, it was meant to be a cup. Okay. But you know how a loving father takes that? He keeps it and treasures it. So that when the child grows up, they may be embarrassed at the things they did when they first got saved. But by the time that they're older and they've been around for a long time, they become more like Jesus. And they recognize, you know, it's okay if people make a mistake. You know, it's okay that they don't understand it all. Maybe they don't got all their theology down. Maybe God is working on them. Maybe nobody gets saved perfectly with all knowledge and all wisdom and all understanding and then walks a perfect life. Maybe, just maybe, we are given grace in order to extend grace to others. Maybe we are forgiven so that we would forgive others. Maybe we are loved so we would love others. Because you see, right now, Christianity has this adamant idea that we have got to fight something. No, you don't. You don't. You're not meant to fight anything except yourself. The armor you're putting on is to protect you from adversaries that are not physical. You are not meant to go out and conquer and save the world. You are meant to, rather, present the opportunity for those who would be saved to come to the realization of Jesus Christ. You are meant to learn to love one another as Jesus loved us. And if you could get this handle on it, because that's where Proverbs 3, 5, 6 is going, we're not out there to separate ourselves from people that are either going this way or that way or kind of going up or down or all around, you know, and kind of making it like, where are they coming from? We're meant to love them in spite of themselves so that they would come to the realization of a personal relationship with Jesus and pursue that part so that whatever God has in store for them, they're prepared for. Because the end of the world is here. We are experiencing it as we live this generation. And as we live it out to the end, we will see the rapture. We will see Jesus come again. But we won't see, you know, God, I hope not. We won't see the Antichrist, you know, we won't see the summation of God's wrath poured out upon the earth. And I pray that you're counted worthy to be spared of those things. But if you're not, if you're not, don't give up. Don't give in. Just 
Start all over again. Walk with Jesus and talk with him and find what it is that he has for you today as well as if you are around in that day. So as we examine my utmost in your face style missionary predestinations and now save the Lord that formed him from the womb to be his servant. Isaiah 49.5 the first thing that happens after we have realized our election to God in Christ Jesus is the destruction of our prejudices and our parochial nations. Let's try that one again. The first thing that happens after we have realized our election to God in Christ Jesus is the destruction of our prejudices and our parochial notions and our patriotisms. That means if you are pledging allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, that is not what God wants you to do. I'm sorry, as patriotic as I am, I would rather sing God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies, from the oceans, white with foam, God bless America, than to try to swear allegiance to something that I no longer am a citizen of because my citizenship is in heaven, that my nationality is not of this world, but it is of a heavenly kingdom, and that my citizenship is in heaven with Jesus. So you see, it's not about patriotism. God destroys that if you are moving on with Jesus. God will eliminate that if you are walking with Jesus. Because you may choose to abide with voting for and doing things that are involved in other advocacies, but is that really what God wants you to do? Well, you have the opportunity to, and you can vote and be a part of that. That's nice. That's good. But couldn't you just pray and accomplish the same thing? Or is prayer not as powerful as your vote? I think Chambers had a point. Our parochial notions and our patriotisms. You see, anyone can be a patriot, but how many can be a Christian? Was Jesus wrapped up in the political scene of his day, or did he not participate in Roman occupation of pa Palestine, of Israel at the time of Palestine, and at the time that they were enslaved literally to Rome and had no self-authority or self-determination. The zealots wanted Jesus to be the ruling king with violence, with rebellion, with freeing them from Roman occupation. And Jesus freed them. But it wasn't that kind of kingdom that he freed them from. It was the kingdom of sin. So you see, if you're stuck in patriotism and you're fighting authorities all the time, maybe you're not doing what Jesus said that you're supposed to do because you were called from the day you got saved to be one thing first above all else. It's a missionary. Go and teach all nations. Go and share the gospel. Go and do all of that means you have one job before you have any other anointing, appointing, or some gifting that you think you have. You're a missionary. And if I could be so bold as to say a missionary covers all the offices, if God wants you to be all the offices, speaking on personal experience, as a missionary, when you go out, you're going to hold all those offices, whether it be apostle, prophet, a pastor, a deacon, an elder, a secretary, a worship leader, whatever it is, God will make you into being that at the moment that there's a need if you are a missionary. And that is what God is calling you to do. We are turned into servants of God for God's own purposes, not our own. The whole human race was created to glorify God and to joy, enjoy Him forever. Sin has switched the human race onto another track, but it has not altered God's purpose in the tiniest degree. 
And when we are born again, we are brought into the realization of God's great purpose for the human race. And that means I am created for God. He made me. This realization of the election of God is the most joyous realization on earth and we have to learn to rely on the tremendous creative purpose of God. The purpose-driven life isn't one of finding what God's purpose is for you because God's purpose for you is already stated. God's purpose for you is to know Him and to obey Him and to follow Him and to listen to Him and to know Him in a personal, intimate, enjoyable way. It's not to get from God and go your way and do your own thing and, hey, man, you know what? I'm going to do this for God. I'm the whatever for God. And you can fill in the blank. You know what that means. No. God has a plan for you. And the plan isn't necessarily according to your will, but what you don't understand. Because in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we always remind people, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding, because your own understanding, frankly, really doesn't amount to hill of beans. Because your own understanding doesn't cut it. God's going to bust it every time. Just about the time you think you got it, yes, I'm going to do it for the Lord. No. Because God will not share his glory with another. He will do it his way. And you may get to bounce around, you know, with your little, oh boy, my ministry thing for a while, but then certainly something's going to go kaboom. And then God's going to either reveal to you what you're doing wrong, if you're listening, or what you're doing right. And he wants you to get bigger <laughs> and expand. But you're created for his glory. You're created for his purposes, for his design. I like to tell people in ministry, the day may come when you find the only thing you were created here on earth to do was one thing, and that might have been to help a little old lady across the street at some point in time. Because if you read in the book of Acts, as recorded in the scriptures, at some point in time, there are some people that are recorded as doing only one thing they are remembered for. What about all the rest of their life? We aren't told. And speaking on personal experience, I'm glad they didn't record all my life because I already know God sees all of it. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Maybe you are too. The realization of the election of God is the most joyous realization on earth because it's no longer your purpose, but his. The first thing God will do with us is to force through the channels of a single heart the interests of the whole world. Say what? The first thing God will do with us is to force through the channels of a single heart the interests of the whole world. The love of God, the very nature of God, is introduced into us and the nature of Almighty God is forced in John 3.16 through God so loved the world. Wait a minute. You aren't going to go to that, like, you know, I got to love the, the Muslim, do I? Eh, not. That's a Muslim. He can't be saved. That's like one of them Jehovah's Witnesses. That's like one of them, you know, atheists. That's like one of them people that, you know what, they aren't one of us, but why God, I don't think they can be saved. And you know what that kind of attitude turns you into? It ain't Popeye. <laughs> it screws your face up. <laughs> it ruins your soul. It takes the love of God and makes it into a religion of God. And you know what religion has done? We're going to save Jerusalem. We're going to be the crusaders and kill them in Islamics because they took over Jerusalem and they're all over there. And we're going to go in the name of the Catholic Church and the Christian and in the name of God. We're going to kill them all. And they did. In history. And it was stupid because they even killed some non-Muslims. Some non-Islamic. Some not people some Jews, and anybody else that was innocent that was standing around got annihilated. Even Christians. So what do you think? For God so loved the world, we get to pick and choose who gets in it?
Maybe. We have to maintain our soul open to the fact of God's creative purpose and not to muddle it with our own interests. No. I want to do it my way. I know how to do it better. I have certain ideas that I thought of that I think were better. And by golly, if I say in the name of Jesus, I can do it, it'll get done. Maybe. If we do, God will have to crush our intentions on one side, however much it may hurt. <laughs> oh, if you've never been crushed by God, sinner, <laughs> what's your problem? Haven't you ever done your own thing before? Oh, I know. It wasn't God that crushed it. The devil did it. And I rebuke that devil because you know what? I was doing God's ministry and I just say, in the name of Jesus. By golly, that had to be the devil. It was being satanically attacked and I just threw that devil out on the street, you know, and, and I never looked at my flesh first. And I never figured out that my attitude was Maybe not as loving as I thought it was. Maybe I uh, had the wrong pair of glasses on. Maybe my focus was wrong. Maybe it wasn't the devil. No. Me? God. No, it couldn't have been me. I had such great ideas. I had such a wonderful marriage. I built my little kingdom and my little household and kaboom, I'm divorced. I'm broke. I'm without a job. No. That can't be a Christian. Or can it? <laughs> if you've gone through those, you are a Christian. Just buy one of these books. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I ain't selling no books. You can get these free. I'm reading one to you. Uh, but just learn from it. God loves you. God so loved the world, remember? You just got to get a handle on what your focus is. You're a missionary. You're saving people's souls. Who cares if they die? They're going to heaven, aren't they? Maybe. Maybe we better work on that. Maybe that's what we're doing right now with you and I. The purpose for which the missionary is created is that he may be God's servant, one in whom God is glorified. When once we realize that through the salvation of Jesus Christ we are made perfectly fit for God, we shall understand why Jesus Christ is so ruthless in his demands. He demands absolute rectitude from his servants because he has put in them the very nature of God. Beware lest you forget God's purpose for your life. God's purpose isn't for you to go out and to become a contemporary Christian music artist. Sorry, that's not recorded anywhere in scripture. God doesn't say that, you know, they that worship me will worship me in spirit and truth and in song and in psalms and in spiritual songs that I've recorded on CD that I could broadcast to the world so that I could be before thousands of concert goers and we could all be worshiping the Lord together and we could sing Kumbaya, ah, ya, 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 Yahweh and all the other things that we do, that we say that are so holy and so wonderful. Yeah, we got the spirit, we got the joy, we got the love, we got to know when we walk outside these doors after the concert and we run right over people as we're going up the parking lot to the poor man that can't afford to go to the concert, who can't buy the CD, who literally is in another country who goes, man, I'd love to be an American Christian. They got it made. 
They seem to be in heaven already. Uh-oh. Didn't Jesus say something about that? Be not content with this world. So you see, your purpose, really, is about the gospel. Because the gospel is meant to go from you to right around you. You are that ambassador for Jesus. You are that missionary. You are the person who's supposed to be trained, who's supposed to be a follower of him who called you. Jesus only took 12, but he changed the universe. He had a lot more following, but they all walked away at some point in time when he asked them to do something they were not willing to do. What are you not willing to do today to fulfill God's purpose in your life? to be the person God wants you to be. Because God wants you to have your personality. No doubt about that. He allowed you to experience life the way you have so that you could touch other people with your pain. Yes, your pain. If you've been divorced, if you suffered the crushing of God, you've also suffered the blessing of Him building you up, of Him loving you, of Him saying to you, you're my child. I will never leave you nor forsake you, that I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Have you shared that? Do you care to learn one-on-one -on -one with a stranger to do that? Will you take the moment that you need to ask God what's hindering you from knowing Him intimately? like Jesus did and like the disciples did so that you would be filled with the abilities not just the ministry Jesus alive in you is the salvation of the world it's not your ministry but it is Jesus in you trust in the Lord with all your heart lean not in your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him let him direct your path today